Welcome back to The People Business. Today's guest, we have Maria Ford. Maria is president of commercial and industrial at DeWalt. Maria, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Frank. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, it's awesome to have you on. So Maria and I met uh, earlier this year. I had the opportunity to come out to Maryland and speak uh, and do some training with uh, MCAA, and it was headquartered at, at DeWalt. And I got to get on your campus and check out how awesome it was. And I was just blown away by your people and your story. And I, there was so much I learned about DeWalt that day, and it made me a, a DeWalt fan. So I'm excited to have Maria on. So Maria, how did you get started in this industry? Well, it was somewhat by default, um, and it really kind of started, I would say, about my senior year in college. Um, I, I often tell people, truth be told, I had a dream that I was going to go into the fashion industry, which clearly is not the path I went. Um, but I did play collegiate sports, and one of my best friends was a couple years older than me, and she was interning at the time um, at Black & Decker which was close to Loyola where I went to college. And she was like, hey, we have an internship. You should you should try it out. She did an internship. Um, she was like, I love it here. It's a great place. And I started my internship my senior year. I was calling on the Home Depots, doing some merchandising. And then I applied for a job as I graduated and got hired on our field team at that time. And I still actually ironically work every single day um, with my best friend, Michelle. So we're still together um, in, in very similar um, roles in the company. So it's pretty cool. 25 plus six years later, we're still together um, working. So that's how I got here. She got me here. She got me in and I saw her doing what she was doing so well and still continues to do and uh, really inspires me to, to keep going and, and stay at what I'm doing every day. I love that. So you actually went to school for fashion and then next thing you know, I I actually wanted to, when I graduated, I wanted to go into the fashion industry thinking, you know, I loved clothes. I still do. And thought that could be something I could do after I graduated college. It was kind of a pipe dream. Um, And then I realized I really got to actually have a career here. And my coach at the time guided me in, in, you know, other directions as well. But, um, Michelle kind of was my inspiration to step into this industry. So, excellent. So that's when you kind of changed your thought process. So you were an athlete. What's what did you play at Loyola? I played lacrosse. Yep, I played lacrosse for for four years while I was there, and her and I were on the same team um, throughout my tenure there. So that's fantastic. So former athlete, also college athlete. What did you take from lacrosse that you brought in? right off the bat to to your your mindsets or or how you approached business every single day because I, I being a former athlete also I, I love seeing how people utilize some of the gifts the tools the lessons so to speak of athletics and they bring them into their work world I think it's three things that I would I would take away from my my experience there it's, it's discipline it's grit and it's teamwork and I had an extraordinary experience while I was at Loyola um, under our coach at that time. And those three things were non-negotiable every single day of my collegiate career. And uh, the discipline was like nothing that I really ever experienced um, in terms of, you know, long hours, long days, a lot of practice, um, couple with schoolwork, also trying to kind of have fun while we were there. Um, and playing at a, a pretty high level. So so the discipline was pretty intense. And, and the grit really came from, as I mentioned, kind of the day in and the day out. It was tough. It was, you know, you're away from your parents. It was hard. It was it was hard work. We worked out a lot. And, you know, we, we played in any kind of weather. We practiced in any kind of weather. Our coach, really, what I didn't know at the time was not teaching us about lacrosse, Frank. She was really giving us life lessons, which I still carry with me till this day. And then the teamwork aspect of it, um, we were a high-performing team. We, we played for the national championship. We lost. So I learned about defeat. 
And I learned, you know, what it felt like to lose, but I also learned what it felt like to be on a high performing team. And all those things, when I looked at Black and Decker, when I graduated, I saw on the culture we had there. And those cultural things, I think, still resonate today um, in DeWalt. And those are the things that, you know, I, I really try and instill in my team as we as we interact together and we go forward in this industry. I think they make really, to me, the, the, the best teams as you think about um, a great culture and a great company. It's something to be able to compete at the absolute highest of levels and to play for a championship. So you, know, you were actually groomed through through athletics to experience a extremely high level culture, right? Which I imagine served you very well as you went out into the workforce knowing what works and, and really what doesn't work. If you could say, like, what would be one thing that, that your coach instilled in you that you still speak to, utilize uh, with your teams today? We we have this say, she used to have this saying about do one more thing, and every day before we finished our practice, it was do one more thing, right? Do one more sprint, um, take one more shot, go for one more run. Um, she used to tell us when she'd leave the grocery store, she'd put one more bag on her arm. It was always this notion of do one more thing, um, and then lastly, it was show up, right? Show up for your teammates when you come out to practice. You're here to practice. When you come out to a game, you owe it to your teammates to show up. And I talk a lot about the, the, you know, let's do one more thing for our customers. We talk a lot about showing up in the face of our customers and our end users and our, and ourselves and our teammates. We also talk about that outside of work, right? I talk to my team a lot about showing up for your families, your friends, yourself outside of your day to day space. Um, you know, we talk a lot about mental health, mental awareness in, in our industry. That's important to step away from the day to day. So. It's really those two things, Frank, that I think resonate for me every day, personally and professionally, is is that do one more thing, right? Because somebody else isn't doing the one more thing. It really separates you. And then the notion of showing up and what it looks like and it means to truly show up time and time and time and again. I think those two things separate the good from the great. I love that. That is awesome. It's really good because one more, right? You can always you can always do one more. Yeah. And you think about that. It's, well, yeah, I could do this tomorrow, but no, like when that's instilled in you, no, yeah. do it not, right? Don't put off to tomorrow what you can do today because, you know, tomorrow's tomorrow, right? So I love that. And then showing up, uh, showing up is, is more than half the battle, right? Yeah. And it, it you know, it's, it's, it's simple. And you think it's easy, but I think what you find is a lot of people don't do it, right? I never got a call back. Someone didn't show up. I mean, just think about it in your day to day. And and the folks that I would say excel and the teams that do, they're constantly showing up, they're following up, showing up again, even in the face of adversity, right? Even when you don't win something that you wanted to win, you're coming back, you're doing it again. It's that relentless um, approach. And I learned that, right? I didn't realize it at the time that that's what she was teaching us. But we, my, my teammates and I still talk about it to this day. And I still, I think, try to live that every day myself and instill that in in my team members and in the way that I go into business and interact with my customers. Well, by doing those things, you are, you are you you said the word, like, how do you stand out? And by doing those things every single day, day in and day out, you do differentiate. 100%. Like y- y- there's a gap of, of you know, it, and as human beings, we want to do p- business with and refer business to those that we know we like and we trust, right? Right. And that is a huge differentiator if, if you're consistently doing those, those things. I, you know, how many, how many people are on your team, Maria, that report to you? There's, um, we, we, I have about a team of 400 people throughout the country. Yeah. Uh, roughly in our in our commercial and our industrial division. That's and that's a lot of people. So like, I I think like one of the biggest challenges we have out there today are, are we're just so distracted, right? I mean, it's like so we have social media and twenty four hour news cycles and the problems of yesterday and how about what's going to happen next next week and it's like our minds are everywhere except like present. Yeah. How- 
how do you get your team to stay uh, focused and, and on the prize, uh, you know, on the right thing? Because like, I think everybody was, is trying to help their people in that way. But, you know, I, I know you're an awesome leader. So I wanted to ask you, what do you, what do you do for that? I mean, I think when I, when I find myself kind of straying, right, or focusing maybe on things that I would question, is there an impact here? I always go back to how is this going to benefit my customer? Mm. Customers in the center of everything that we do. Is this going to be a benefit short term, mid term, or long term for my customer? And my customer being our distribution partners who distribute our amazing brands, but also our end users. And if the answer is no, right, I have to, I have to say to myself, why am I doing this? Right? Is this really where I want to spend my time? It does force me to then quickly pivot, Frank, um, to get back to that that core. Right. And that message is held very tightly with our senior executive leadership team. Customers are at the center of everything that we do. And it's our distributor partners and our end users. And we have to really gear ourselves back to that because because, look, we can all get pulled in a million different directions, whether it's internal stuff or these external things. Um, So that's what I really try and challenge my team um, to think about. And I know I do that for myself. Because it's easy, to your point, you can get pulled in a lot of different directions to do things that probably don't really always benefit, um, at least for us, that that most important piece. That is such a great answer. I, I love that because it is. That's the as long as you keep your eyes on the, what's the core, the center, and it's it's our customers, right? And you you really it, it keeps you on the right path, right? Yes. You don't get distracted. If and if you do get distracted, it's like okay, let's let's get back to that north star, and it's our customers, and and what do you know? How can we better serve them? I love that. That's really awesome. I think sometimes too, you know, we I have some functions internally that support our sales team, right? So I try and encourage them to recognize that your customer is the sales team. You everybody has a customer, right? It's just it's just a matter of do you recognize your customer? Do you know what their priorities are? Do you know what's important to them? And how well do you serve them, right? My customer, I have two customers. I have a 13 and a 10 year old. They happen to be my customers every single day, or at least I feel that way. Uh, I mean, so we all have customers of different types. It's just we serve them in, in different manners for sure. Yeah. I, I, my definition of a customer is uh, anyone that depends on you to get their job done. Yeah. It, 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 that could be, yeah, your family, your kids, your, you know, uh, if you're a coach or, you know, whatever it is. So that, that's really awesome. Um, you said a key word that I, I wanted to point out that you really challenged them. And I think like that's something today that a lot of leaders are, are missing out on. They're, they're fearful of challenging their teams to better perform. Uh, and to keep their eye on the prize and to stay focused. You know, it's almost like challenging is a bad word today. And I don't like that. I think like we do need a challenge. Like Doc Rivers, the the basketball coach said, you know, uh, good players, they want to be coached and great players want to be told the truth. Yeah. And, and like the truth is we need a challenge from time to time. We're human, right? Right. So is that something that you guys continually talk about and and do within DeWalt? Yeah. I mean, I, we have a, I would say a a culture of, you know, we're tough. I call it tough love. I always tell my team that, look, I, I I love you, right? I'm here to support you, but I'm going to challenge you. And, and I think anybody that knows me would tell you, um, my, my personality type, like style and the way I lead is absolutely that way. And I think challenging myself too, right? Are we are we doing the absolute best that we can? And we got to be honest with ourselves. If we're not, what is it that we need to do better? How can we continue to be agile? How can we continue to transform? Um, it's only going to make us better. So I would tell you that we very much have a culture of challenging ourselves. Um, you know, we, we talk about not taking things personal, right? We all are here to support each other. If you have trust in each other, and you challenge each other, you shouldn't have concerns over why you're being challenged. And I think trustworthy is a very important thing amongst a team dynamic. From there, right, when you do start to question and peel back and, and dig in, 
people's guards are down. They recognize that it's for a greater cause. Well, that's everything. Yeah. If I trust you uh, as a leader, I I know that you're doing things uh, not necessarily for your best best interest, but for the team, like what is going to help us get there. Right. But but in those cultures that trust is fractured, you know, you see, you see a lot more strife uh, when it comes to those type of situations, but that comes with earning trust, right? I mean, it has to be earned every single day and, and, and you can't expect people to go do things that you wouldn't do yourself, right? Right. Absolutely. I love that. And I love that culture of what you, what you're doing at DeWalt. DeWalt is, I think maybe it was you who told me that you're the only company in the power tool industry that is headquartered in the United States. That's correct. We are. Uh, we actually just celebrated our 100 year anniversary. Uh, we trade on the New York Stock Exchange, which was really exciting. We are headquartered in New Britain, Connecticut. Although we do manufacture all over the world, we are the only company from a power tool perspective that is headquartered in the United States. Um, so absolutely something to be proud of. Um, we are a global company, but as I mentioned, uh, we are headquartered in New Britain, Connecticut, and just celebrated 100 years of um, awesome, I would say, legacy from a DeWalt brand perspective. And we're really celebrating that, Frank, I think, and, you, and we've talked about it a little bit, but with our entire push around the trades and, and being emphatic with supporting trade initiatives in our industry and I think you've seen that come to life in, in certain spaces, whether it's through the MCAA um, or some of the other sponsorship, sponsorships that we've done. So, I love this Grow the Trades initiative. Yes. Uh, so you are you have a goal, a plan in place, right? Where you are, you you guys are going out of your way to bring value, bring resources, help people grow the trades, bring more people into the trades because you see the gap, right? Right. That's right. I mean, we continuously hear, hey, we have a, we have a workforce development gap. Um, we need support, right? That is the voice of our customers, users, companies. And we really started this initiative in 2023 around, you know, the Grow the Trades initiative. It's the $30 million commitment, Frank, over five years. Um, and we'll complete that initiative by 2027. And it's really to support organizations that are, you know, skilling, reskilling and upskilling tradespeople. So it, it can be to help get the tradespeople into the industry. It can be to skill them once they're in, reskill, and then continue to skill. And I think right in the avenue of, of what you're doing is it could be around leadership development. It can be around continued technical um, type opportunities. We've done a lot. And obviously, I am passionate around the um, diversity in the trades. We do a lot with veterans. So there are so many opportunities um, for us to continue to help the industry uh, move forward in this initiative. So it's um, we're in year two. We're actually just closing out our grant window. Uh, we open up a grant window every single year where we allow applicants to come in and apply for both monetary and or um, tool grants. And we review those grants and then award those winners in the September timeframe. So it is, um, I've mentioned it multiple times as I've spoken in the industry. I would tell you it's one of the, the most rewarding things I've been able to be a part of in my 25 years because I've seen the impact that this can make on the recipients. I recently was able to go give one of the grants to a local high school. It's a technical high school in Philadelphia. And to see the impact that this made on the 13 seniors that were graduating it was absolutely amazing. I felt beyond proud of what our company is doing um, for the industry. It's phenomenal. Phenomenal. It is. It's absolutely awesome. And I I say this a lot, but I, I give a lot of credit to our executive leadership team um, for, for really directing our spend in this area. It is um it is phenomenal and, and it's it's gonna continue. So I'm excited to be a part of it. Well, I can see why. And when you have a company that is doing things like that to really, you know, you know, to grow, to 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 build relationships, to connect people, to provide the resources, whatever it takes, because 
you know, seventy five percent. I was reading of the workforce in our industry is retiring in the next seven to ten years. Right? That's right. It's and right. if somebody doesn't take the lead on this and drive this, where are we going to be at that time? Yeah. And there's so many, I think, you know, there are so many great organizations that are behind this. And it's really awesome to see. I think we continue to see the trends. And there's been so many great articles, whether it's the Wall Street Journal, that have put out, um, you know, I think it was called The Next Generation, The Tool Belt, The Next Generation. It's so wonderful to see. Uh, but I think we've just, you know, scratched the surface. If you look at the data, we still have room, obviously a lot of room to continue to improve. So we're just on the beginning of our journey here and, and we're looking forward to continuing to work with our great partners in the industry. I love it. And, you know, like for me, I invested in it also, like I'm all in on it. Like, you know, I, again, I, I wish I would have known about the opportunities that were in the industry back when I was a young guy and I was, you know, and I, I got into the trades late. Like I got into the trades at 40 years old, you know, right. and, and, but still, I mean, like it's never too late to pivot. I have three very, very close friends who went into the trades in their late thirties and early forties and, you know, and, and they love it now. Uh, it, I just wish, you know, more people would have been aware of those opportunities. And, and that's what DeWalt is doing is, is really bringing more awareness, bringing resources and yeah, kudos to you um, and your team who are doing that. Um, it was awesome to meet you guys all out there. Uh, John Holland and yourself, you're all, everyone was so gracious and so hospitable. Um, so it, it was really cool. To yeah, be- that was a great event. It was an awesome event. I think I think you could see, right, some of the things I talked about earlier in our culture and in, in the 25 people that were part of the MCA event. Um I think you could see us kind of come to live at that event. So it was great to meet you there too. I, yeah. I really enjoyed that that session. We look forward to doing more of those. I think it, it was it was awesome. Well, your the attendees loved it also. You know, they had a blast. You know, and I talked to some of them after the fact. So they can't wait to uh, to come back the next time you do it. So that's great. So tell me about a little bit. So moving forward now with where this is. This is a $30 million over five years, right? That's the goal? Correct. Yep. Okay. And, you know, when when you achieve that goal, like what are, you know, what what is the overall desired outcomes for DeWalt? Like, what are you looking, like, what's the end game in terms of helping the industry get to a certain place or? Yeah. I mean, I think the goal is that we'd want to be able to say that there's data, right, in the industry that shows we've made or we've been a piece of many people that have made investments or many organizations that have made investments to continue to drive either the number of, as I mentioned, women in the industry, veterans in the industry. There are statistical data that exists, you know, graduating um, seniors and or VOTEC. All of that data, we we eventually, after the five year period, want to go back and be able to say, were we part of right a greater cause to help move um, those numbers? It is ultimately, and then I, I think there's the obvious other side of it outside of the data is, are we able to continue to say that we were a part of um, you know the development for companies? The data is one side, but I think there's also. I would say that the human side of it as well. And I know that's already happening for us. We've had many, many success stories in many different markets that data or no data, we know we're, we're winning and we're making an impact. So um, yeah, I think, I think that's how we, how we measure the success of it, Frank. I can see. Yeah. And there's definitely, you have some framework there for how you do that. So in, in that like five years down the road, 10 years down the road, like how, the industry seems to be evolving a little bit. How do you see it evolving? And how are you guys positioning yourself to to serve the industry, you know, into into the next five to ten years? Yeah, I mean, I think we, you know, a couple of things. We talked a little bit about um diversity in the industry, right? I think we're we're trying to obviously continue to help the industry bring in diversity, whether it's um ethnicity diversity, whether it's gender diversity. Um, we have a lot of conversations today around training from a you know Hispanic perspective, I think is one great example. How can we help kind of bring that along? Um, you know, the safety aspect of the industry, Frank, is is arguably one of the most important aspects that we can continue to help the industry evolve. 
It's wonderful to see some of the great initiatives around mental health and safety. A lot of um, a lot of great, I would say, you know, industry events. It sounds like there's going to be a big new one in January of 2025 with the conglomerates of um, some of the you know the big associations that will take place. So, to me, safety is is core, and we have to continue to to support and be a part of that. And I would say those are really the the two big things. You know, I think we talk a lot about the up and coming generations, right? They work differently, whether it's through technology, um, you know, just continuing to be empathetic of the younger generation and and the way they go to work and view work. I think, unfortunately, that generation tends to get at times a, you know, a bad rap on how and, and how they go about work, but they're the up and coming workforce, right? So we have to continue to learn what makes them tick as much as uh, things that made us tick once in our in our younger years. So to me, that's important, right? To support the younger generation. And they have a lot of things, a lot of great things that they can bring to us um, as an industry as well. I agree 100%. I, I think that the people that are constantly complaining about that workforce are yeah. the people that are not being open to how they potentially, you know, want to work or how, you know, or because, because they grew up in a different time. Like, you know, I didn't grow up in the touchscreen era. Right. So like for me, I didn't grow up with a cell phone in my hand. Uh, I didn't grow up. Yeah. So for me, it's, you know, and for folks that are older than me, they're like, oh, this, they can't do this and they can't, but they can do a lot of other great things. I think they're more prepared uh, at certain times that they do, uh, their homework more when it comes to, you know, understanding it and they don't wing it. Like a lot of people do in our, you know, a little bit older and, you know, yes, they do work different and yes, but are you open to, and you, and you, you killed it there with making them tick, right? Like, and you have to be one, you have to want to learn to, to understand people. Right. I think one of the biggest things that I've learned is, is their vision around purpose um, what, what is your company's purpose, right? What, what is the bigger picture that you're here for? And, you know, I think for us, it's, it's things like grow the trades, right? It, we, we do more than sell power tools and we should for this industry and we are. And I, and I think a lot of young folks before they go to a company, they want to, they want to know, what are you doing? What are you doing for, you know, our industry, our country? And that's important. I can honestly say I didn't ask those questions when I was graduating, right? It was other things, it, but it's great. We we need a little bit more of that, I believe, as we as we go forward. Well, I had the opportunity at the WIMI conference to interview uh, the uh, 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 two very very uh, smart and sharp, you know, young ladies, and, and they were in the process of going in. And um, Gina was the recipient uh, of the MCA. Uh, she won the scholarship this past year uh, and she was extremely intelligent. And she said, Frank, like, that's exactly what she said. I, and her, her to quote hers, I would get, I would, money's important, don't get me wrong, but I would pass up more money to be in a place that has the right culture and that has the vision and has purpose. And that's it. Like the, the younger generation doesn't, value dollars as much as they value purpose, I believe. Uh, they sold their parents, grandparents, you know, um, you know, stay loyal to a company uh, potentially, and then they retired and they didn't end up with that much. And, you know, as a result of that, you know, it's what's the vision, what's the purpose? And you can go get a job anywhere that's an exchange of dollars for hours. That's right. right? If there's no bigger purpose, uh, though, what do you really have? Yeah. That's right. I, I completely agree with you. So I think that's a an added benefit to the the younger generation that's coming through. I love it. Purpose is, you know, imagine like, you know, because without it, you don't really have much. So I think a lot of companies um, out there, you know, are, are trying to figure out like, who, what are we really here to do? Like, what's, what's our North Star? Um, you had mentioned your North Star, I believe, in a prior interview. I heard you talk to the, your North Star. What was your your North Star? Yeah, I mean, I think my, you know, my North Star has evolved over time um, as I've kind of gotten more tenured in, in my career. Uh, I would say younger in my career, my North Star was 
you know, getting a job that I thought, I thought was fun, right? In a fun industry, fun people. That obviously has changed. Um, I'm a mother and I spend a lot of time with my children. Um, you know, I would tell you my my North Star now is really around um, changing our industry as it as it goes, right? And I think this Grow the Trades piece is, is just a perfect example of it is um, one person at a time. I, I talk to Angie Simon a lot and we go back and forth on you know, getting women in to the trades and retaining them and making them understand that they can do it. We're into the industry. And to me, that's my North Star, right? I, I always want to help every single female recognize that, yes, it's hard. Yes, it's challenging. Yes, you're going to hit roadblocks, but you can do it. Um, and that, that to me, keeps me kind of going, right? There's days, there's many days where it's hard and you're juggling a lot and it's not easy, um, but that really, that's, that's my North star. And then, you know, I think the obvious would be my two children, um, are, are my most important, um, North stars every single day. I love that. So and with your children, like, you know, and, and, you know, overseeing 400 people, like how do you balance, you know, work and, and home life? Like, because that has to be, I don't, I don't, I, I, I get asked this a lot and I always say, I don't. Um, I don't, I don't, I just, some days I do. And some days I don't, you know, some days I, I master it and, and other days I don't. And I try to just in the days I don't, it's really makes me crazy. Um, but I just try to recognize that not every day is the same and some days I'm going to nail it. And then other days it's going to kind of feel a little crazy, um, or weeks for that matter. You know, it just really, really depends um, I have a great support system. I have a wonderful mother um, who helps me a lot, and she's she's outstanding. So um, I have a great family, and I, I would say those are the things that kind of get me through and continue to support me as I try to balance the days that I that I do balance. And I work for a great company. You know, Stanley Black and Decker is is flexible. Um, they recognize that we have jobs to do, but they also recognize that. Um, no two people are cut from the same cloth. We all have different personal circumstances and we get our jobs done in different ways. And they've been phenomenal in terms of supporting all of our different circumstances at work. Um, and that's important. I think that's so important when we talk about, you know, things like getting diversity into, into the industry. It's a big deal, right? It's, it's a different, sometimes it's different for different people and, and how they maybe have to show up to work every single day. And our company has been phenomenal in that respect. Well, that's a, yeah, you touch on a very important point and that's, it's that flexibility piece. And and that's another thing that, that the younger people want, right? They want a little bit more flexibility. Yep. Uh, you know, I think there's a, 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 and I had this conversation at Wemby with, with a, uh, with someone, but they were, we were talking about, you know, it's important for me to know that I'm going to go work for a company that I do want to have ki- kids potentially down the road. It, you know, what does that look like? What's, you know, right. am I gonna, am I going to get, is my career path going to stall out because of that? Or, you know, and working for a company that no, like has clear communication and no, you, you will be able to still do whatever you want, you know, and, and get where you want to go is so important, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I feel like part of my role at Stanley Black and Decker over the years has to been you know, help kind of chart that bumpy road over the 25 years. There was a time and a place where it was unchartered waters, right? For many reasons, it just, there were not as many women and there weren't many people having babies. So it was a different time to go on. You know, there was a lot of different things. So I've enjoyed kind of help creating that path and what it looks like. And we have, you know, for that, we have many young women that are, on my team and and coming up in our team. And I think we all are continuing to create that journey. So um, it's important. And and again, our company values it. They value our feedback. And it's, I always say this, it's not only for women that work, it's also for my male counterparts. You know, there's a lot of working men and women now, both families, um, both parents work. And it's important for flexibility for men as well, right? That want to be involved in their kids' lives and, and do things. So it's, it's something that I would say Stanley Black and Decker absolutely values and and take seriously as, as we think about you know hiring good talent and bringing people in and creating that culture that we talked about earlier. Yeah, it's it, it, it's paramount, and uh, you know I think that's 
there, I, I look at, there's always benefits to everything that happens. There's always positive things. And, you know, that was one of the things that came from the pandemic was I think it woke a lot of us up on what's really important in life because we had the opportunity to see what, that we were running this quote unquote rat race and time was next thing you know, you know, you're 20, you're 40, you're 60, where'd my life go? You're 80, right? And the pandemic allowed us to, to see like, no, like work is important, but right. flexibility and the opportunities to have that. Um, and, and the companies that that don't seem to have that as much today, they're really struggling to find talent. I agree. Absolutely. So you guys are doing a phenomenal job. You're a pathfinder in this of how, you know, of helping. If you could give some advice, uh, maybe to somebody who's listening out there who wants to come into the industry, uh, maybe is a little reluctant, uh, you know, just for, you know, because of the numbers or, you know, they're you know, a little bit like, I don't know if I should do it. What would you say? I would say get some mentors, right? I think the best thing you can do is have solid mentors, both women and men. In fact, some of my best mentors have been men. Um, and I think it's so important. Um, in addition to kind of cl- cross collaborate, I've met so many great women in different companies in this industry um, and men that we constantly are talking about you know, how do we get more people into this industry? So I think networking is a really, is a really big thing. Once you do get into the industry, there's that really important piece that I don't think we talk about enough is the retaining. Um, you know, we tend to lose people in that seven to eight year mark mm-hmm. for probably a lot of different reasons. I know we ourselves, right? It could be, you know, hey, I'm going to decide to start a family. But I think in general, getting into the industry, it's have a great mentor, right? aspire to look up to somebody maybe who has been in the industry for a long time, potentially maybe somebody that's been in for a shorter period of time, um, but be diverse in that in that mentor base. And I think that is so incredibly important um, to have to have kind of that that circle, if you will. Yeah, I, I agree 100 percent. And but for some and I think we've all heard like, you know, go get a, a mentor. But like for some reason, uh, I think, I don't know if it's being vulnerable. I don't know if it's, but for me, like mentorship just kind of happened organically. Like, mm-hmm. like I connected with somebody, built a relationship and then I next thing on, they're my mentor. Like, you know, I learned from them and right. And, and I, you know, for me, like when I came into the industry, it was how many mentors could I potentially have? Like, you know, I had two or three then, you know, that and it, all for different reasons also, right. not just one reason. Yeah. So, mentorship is is everything like i'm not the smartest guy in the world but what i do know is this i'm going to figure out who the best person i can learn from is and then what can i learn from them that i can take and make my own right right exactly and, you know that that i don't have to recreate the wheel at that point but i think it, it, that takes a little vulnerability and you know being open to to learning right right for sure I love it. So my last question for you, you ready? Yep, I'm ready. Oh boy. I'm going to hit you with one here. All right. So we're at uh, Maria's retirement party. You've got your colleagues, your employees who work for you, your friends, right? Your family. How do you want people to describe doing business with you, working with you, working for you? What would you like your legacy to be? That's a good one. I've never thought about that. I would say the people that have worked for me um, first, I would say that I would hope um, they would think as me as inspiring them to do more, right? And to be the best that they can be both inside work and outside work um, as individuals. I would say that's first and foremost, um, very important to me. I would hope that they would say that, you know, they recognize that I help them kind of create some balance in their life um, and recognize that personal time is important as well as our professional lives, because I am very emphatic about that. Um, I would hope that my customers um, would see me or I guess say at my retirement party that 
I relentlessly, um, because I am relentless, relentlessly um, fought for them, if you will, in terms of um, providing them the very best service and solutions that I I possibly could over my time. And, you know, I, I would say lastly, most importantly to me is, is that I was a good person, right? That I was just a good person and they enjoyed spending time with me over, over my, my career. And I made their lives better in some form or fashion, both professionally and personally. And to me, that's more important than any amount of, um, you know, power tools they can say that I tried to sell them or, whatever I did over my, my tenure and time. But I would say those, those would be the things that would mean the most to me. I love it. What a great answer. Leave it better than you found it. Help people and, uh, be the path, right. To, to help, to, to guide people. So Maria, you are a badass. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, it was a pleasure. Thank you, Greg. you. And, uh, many more. I, it's yeah. many more. Absolutely. We have a job to do, right? We've just uh, just started. That's right. And that, and it means showing up every single day and doing one more. Doing one more. One more grocery bag, Frank. That's when you're right. at the grocery store, you're going to think of me. Instead of pushing your cart to your car and you have six bags in your arm, you said you were a wrestler. Don't <laughs> Start, put the two more bags on your arm and do two more bags. If you saw me leaving a store, yeah. I will never take a cart to my vehicle. I'm yeah. that guy that has got everything on my arms. I'm yeah. dropping stuff. People probably are laughing at me, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> what? All right. I thank you, everyone, for joining us. And until next time, have a great day. Thank you. 